Shabbat Shalom, everyone. I'm Monty Judah with Lionel Lamb Ministries. Welcome to our program uh, this morning. We are in a series of teachings here called Messianic Teachings for Christians. And as I shared in the very first program, part of the reason why we're sharing this is there are some differences between what Messianic believers believe and what the average Christian believes. And this is to address some of those differences and hopefully encourage and exhort you to investigate that there's a basis for these messianic teachings to be followed. Um, last week, we opened up our program by going to a passage of Scripture most are familiar with, which is Matthew chapter 5, in which the Yeshua specifically says, Think not that I came to abolish the law and the prophets. I did not come to abolish, but to fulfill. Uh, the rub and the discussion between a messianic believer and a Christian believer is what does the word fulfill mean? Now, if you follow, and by the way, forgive me, I'm going to use generalizations here. Since I used to be a Baptist preacher, I know what I'm talking about in this regard. Um, the word fulfill, as used by the average preacher, teacher in, in the Christian faith, means that the law and the prophets were brought to some sort of completion, that they now are fading away and they're not really relevant to our faith, and that therefore the emphasis has now moved to the grace of God and to salvation by faith, that somehow or another, when, when we had a Torah and we had the law of Moses, that somehow people were saved by keeping the law. And now, through the Messiah, no, we're saved by faith and the work of the Messiah. And they, they want a position that Yeshua came and kind of made all of that kind of go away. And that he's doing something new. We, we say New Testament versus Old Testament. We, we have a lot of language uh, generalizations that are made in the Christian world that support this definition of the word fulfill, meaning to banish, pass away, whatever. The irony, as I tried to point out to you in the first program, is that it's clear in the context of this statement by Yeshua that in no wise can you think the word fulfill means to lessen at all what the Torah, the law, and the prophets is. It's to fill them up with even greater meaning is really what the context is. And that you have to ignore statements that Yeshua makes immediately, like, for example, not a jot or tittle shall pass away until all is accomplished. I can assure you that not all of what is said in the law and the prophets has been accomplished, not the least of which is the coming of the Messiah and establishing his kingdom. That has not happened yet. And uh, there's general acceptance about all those things. There's still things in the Law and the Prophets that are still relevant. So you have this irony of where you have a Christian teacher saying, oh, yeah, there's still some stuff that's still appropriate, but, but it's not. Don't, don't use that as my main reference text of the faith. We're replacing that with the New Testament and those things, especially the teaching of Paul. They also ignore the fact that Yeshua specifically said that if any man teaches another so as to annul the least of these commandments, he shall be least in the kingdom of heaven. Oh my gosh. Um, the Christian world and Christian teachers and preachers, they have annulled all kinds of commandments that are in the law. Not only the least one, but all of them. In fact, if you walk up to your average Christian, you say, what commandment was he referred to, which is called the least of the commandments? What law is that? They have no idea what Yeshua is talking about. They have no idea what he just said. But he very clearly said the following. If you diminish in any way, annul any commandment given in the law of Moses, you will be least in the kingdom. You might be saved, saved by faith, but in the kingdom, you, you will be the least in the kingdom. And then he goes further and he says, any man who teaches and keeps the law and all of the commandments, he shall be great in the kingdom. Now, 
there's no way that Yeshua saying those things could then suggest that the word fulfill that he used means to diminish or pass away or annul. There's just no way that you can come up with that definition. However, this is the common teaching. This is commonly what is taught in the Christian faith, whether you be Catholic, Protestant, or any denomination of your choosing. This is the general understanding of Christians. I, as a Messianic teacher, am coming to tell you that Yeshua didn't teach that. Yeshua taught that if you love me, keep my commandments. That's what he taught. And the problem is, is that we don't have uh, a whole lot of those teachers out there that are willing to keep the commandments and teach others to keep the commandments and still be believers of Yeshua. They're in short supply in this world. Um, truly, it's a remnant uh, that's in amongst all of the people. I want to take you to this particular program. I want to take you to another area that was mentioned last week. I want to look at it a little closer, and that's from Acts chapter 15. You see, as the faith progressed, um, and, and suddenly Gentile believers started coming in the faith, you see, when it was just Jewish believers, this question never came up. Every Jewish believer knew you were supposed to keep the law, even though you believed in the Messiah. We, we didn't see it, an inconsistency between the, the law of Moses and the coming of the Messiah. We saw the law of Moses prophesy him to come. We see the Messiah coming and teaching the Torah. We see him teaching the, the, and correcting the errors of the Pharisees and the scribes and the Sadducees. He's correcting those mistakes. But Gentiles now come in, and suddenly there's a great question about, well, how did Gentiles and people from the nations, how do they fit in against this? And when they became, when they started being saved, coming into the faith, when there was a lot of Jewish believers, namely who'd come out of the Pharisaic background, they're still holding on to some of these Pharisaic add-ons, if you will, to the law of Moses, and there's a controversy that begins to happen when Paul shows up with a bunch of Gentile believers from his ministry, and they're there to visit Jerusalem along with him. And suddenly these Pharisaic believers uh, start challenging them as to whether or not, quote, they're saved like them. So go with me now to Acts chapter 15. Let me read a bit to you to see how this whole conference came into being. And certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, saying, Except you be circumcised after the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and questioning with them, the brethren appointed that Paul and Barnabas and certain other of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. They therefore, being brought on their way by the church, passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, declaring the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy among all of the brethren. And when they had come to Jerusalem, they were received of the church and the apostles and the elders, and they rehearsed all things that God had done with them. They shared the testimony about how these Gentiles had come to faith, and they were excited and joyful about hearing the gospel message that by faith God could forgive you of your sins and give you the promise of eternal life. Acts 15, verse 5. But there arose up certain of the sect of the Pharisees who believed, saying, It is needful to circumcise them and to charge them to keep the law of Moses. Now the contention is the Pharisee, Pharisaic believers are saying, You have to be circumcised, you have to keep the law of Moses for salvation. The only way you can get saved. Well, that is not what Yeshua taught. Even Moses didn't teach that. I got news for you. Even Moses didn't teach that. This is the add-on that was done by the Pharisees. They would put all these do's and don'ts, and they would add to what the law said with regard to this. When Yeshua came along, he was at great odds with them. So they're still caught up in what we call the leaven of the Pharisees, the things that the Pharisees had added to the law. And they're confused about what is the basis of salvation for the Gentiles coming in. So they decide to be gathered 
Acts 15, verse 6, and the apostles and elders were gathered together to consider this matter. And when they had been much questioning, Peter rose and said unto them, Brethren, you know that a good while ago God made a choice among you, and that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe. And what Peter's referring to is back in Acts chapter 10, when he was dispatched to go to the house of Cornelius, and there a Gentile centurion accepted the Lord along with his servants, and they saw what had taken place. Peter, when he came back to Jerusalem, he got chewed out by the Jewish believers. Well, what are you doing to a Gentile's house? And Peter explains in Acts chapter 10 that God had to give him a vision um, of unclean things, and, 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 and the vision was to explain to Peter he no longer gets to call Gentiles unclean. And Paul didn't have this problem. Paul didn't need a vision to understand this. He knew the Torah very well. He knew the promises in the Torah were for all people of the world. In your seed will all the families of the earth be blessed. Paul knew that, and he operated on that. Um, Peter had to learn that lesson. Being a good Jew, he had to learn it. And so God had to give him a vision to teach him on that. He, Peter continues on. And God, who knows the heart, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Spirit, even as he did unto us. And he made no distinction between us and them, cleansing their hearts by faith. And after they had held their peace, James answered, saying, Brethren, hearken unto me. James is kind of the, the guy in charge. He's the guy that the brethren had come together and had set up, we'll set up this council and we'll have one guy operate as monitor and, and kind of judge. This position is what was referred to as the judgment seat of Moses. When you would have a group of believers come together, you would appoint one person who would be the moderator, who would be the judge of the decision, who would render the final judgment. And he would look for consensus to form. He would listen to the most sound arguments and he would make a judgment so that the brethren could go forward. James is in that position. We've got Paul with some Gentiles giving testimony. We have Peter, him coming. We have these Pharisaic believers that are coming. They're hearing all the voices. So we hear the speech of Peter, and now we hear James rendering judgment over at this council. And so it continues on to say this. <clears throat> this is James speaking, verse 14. Simeon has rehearsed how God first visited the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. And to this, the words of the prophets agree. It is written, and after these things, I will return, I will, again, I will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will build again the ruins thereof, and I will set it up, that the residue of men may seek after the Lord and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who maketh these things known from old. Now, you sit down with the average Christian and you go back to this quote, which is from the prophet Amos, and you say, explain to me what this means. You'll be hard pressed to find any Christian who can go through that passage of Scripture like James did and explain to you what it means. And the reason is because most Christians have no training whatsoever in the Law and the Prophets. They don't understand a lot of things they say. James does. And he's basically confirming what Peter said and what Paul had said. There is a very clear prophecy this is from Amos that he's quoting from. Other prophets say the same thing. Moses says the same, but he quoted from Amos. He says, this is God's plan. There's a day coming when I'm going to rebuild the tabernacle of David, which has fallen, and I will bring the remnant of mankind forward, and it will include Gentiles who will come and help me to establish my kingdom. And I have prophesied this from days old. 
This is my plan from the very beginning. God's plan from the very beginning with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was he was going to use them as the starting element to form a nation that would become a light to the nations, and all the nations of the world, all peoples, tribes, and tongues, will be part of God's kingdom. Well, that's what we preach in the gospel. Well, the gospel was preached first by God to Abraham. That's what Paul says. So where do we get this idea of the gospel is something new in the New Testament is different from the law? That is an error. That is not correct. So the whole motivation that has gone in from the Christian teachers about we're doing something new and different than what Moses did and what the prophets did, that's the reason why Yeshua had to finish, fulfill them, make them go away, so we could do the new thing that the Messiah is coming to do. That's your basic teaching of the church. That whole concept is false. Right here in the New Testament, James is quoting a passage that says, no, the plan for the Gentiles to come into the faith through the gospel has always been the plan, and it was declared by God for many days past. That's what Moses and the prophets were talking about. Here's Amos the prophet talking about the issue they're dealing with right there, succinctly saying Gentiles are supposed to be included. The, the only key point was, well... <laughs> If they don't keep the law, I mean, what, what, how, what, how are they supposed to deal with all that? I mean, how do we deal with all of those issues? The follow-on questions about the commandments and how do we address the commandments. Same kind of issue that we have in the Christian world where we're told that if we love the Lord, we'll obey Him, obey His commandments, and yet we believe salvation is by faith. And, and by the way, the whole Christian world is scared to death that if you start obeying God's commandments, that somehow you've lost your faith in God for salvation. Somehow you think you're trying to keep the commandments to be saved, and somehow you've lost your salvation. You take your average Messianic believer, and they go to their family and friends after they've decided to change, change their heart toward keeping his commandments. So let's say they start keeping Sabbath. Let's say they start keeping clean and unclean with regard to food. Let's say... They start um, keeping the feast of the Lord. They'll be accused, oh, you're trying to keep the commandments of God. You're trying to be saved by keeping commandments. That's the accusation that's made. Absolutely false. Absolutely false. Yet that's what they think it means. And we as Messianics, we come in, we present the evidence of, I want to obey the commandments of the Lord. We're not saying we're keeping them perfectly. But we come in with a new heart, a new attitude. I, I want to keep them. I, I want to love God that way. I, I want to follow through in my faith. I, I believe Him. I want to love Him. So therefore, I want to do everything I can to demonstrate that toward God. I'm going to obey what He says. And, and all of a sudden, the Christian world, because of Christian teaching, oh, if you do that, oh my goodness, you know, you're trying to be saved by, by works. It's false. That teaching is a lie. And right here in the book of Acts, they're going to give you some instructions. How in the world do we sort out this business about salvation by faith, being saved, and what do we do with the law then? What do we do with all those commandments? Well, obviously, we're not keeping the commandments to be saved. We got that, okay? So what else does he say here? He's now going to write, James is going to write a letter to the Gentile believers saying, this is how you should be dealing with the law now that you're saved. Here's going to come the answer. Because we're not walking away from the law. We have to take some action with regard to it. So he goes where he says, Acts 15 verse 19, Wherefore my judgment is that we trouble them not, from among the Gentiles who are turning to God, but that we write unto them, and he says, he's going to th say three things, that they abstain from the pollutions of idols, from fornication, and from what is strangled, and from blood. He gives three instructions, that there are three instructions from the law that they must keep. 
you have salvation by faith, but you must do these three things. And essentially what he's saying is, if you Gentiles want to come in and have fellowship with us as believing Jews, these three things must be done to be in fellowship with us. Number one, if you're still coming in and bringing your idols from the nations where you're at, and your faith is not in, in the God of Israel exclusively, if you're mixing him with any other God, you can't be in fellowship with us. I don't care what you say about your salvation, that you believe in the Messiah. You cannot be a part. God has emphatically said that he's a jealous God. He will not tolerate you mixing any other God with him. He's emphatic about this. And, he, and he'll kick you out of the assembly if you do it. Number two, he says here that you um, uh, avoid fornication. Now, the word fornication as used here is a general term for a whole bunch of aberrant sexual behaviors. That's what the word fornication means here. This includes homosexuality, bestiality, uh, incest with other family members, um, adultery. It in any sort of misbehavior of a sexual nature is under the banner of what's called fornication. And if you want a full and comprehensive list on all of this, just go to Leviticus chapter 18. That's the law. That's what describes what fornication is. So he's saying all those behaviors, you can't come and be in the fellowship with us messianic believers if you bring those habits in that you had when you were in the nations. And by the way, in the other nations that were coming to faith, um, um, uh, pedophilia was extremely common in the Greek world. Incest was common. Adultery was common. Bestiality was common, having sex with animals. These were common things. And they were saying, if you're coming to faith in the Messiah and you're believing the God of Israel, you cannot bring any of those activities into the fellowship with us. The Bible is explicit about this. Leviticus 18, all you have to do is read it. It's, it, it, it makes no bones about it whatsoever. It's unacceptable. It's an abomination to God uh, to have these activities. Simply said, let's say I'm in a messianic assembly, our brethren here, and you come into the messianic assembly, and you're a Gentile person, and you accept the Lord, you believe, praise God, we welcome you into the assembly, and all of a sudden it's revealed to us that you also uh, bow down to Buddha. It's not going to work. It's not going to work here. Furthermore, we find out that you're a womanizer. You're a whoremonger. You like to visit prostitutes on a regular... You're, you're not going to be here. You commit adultery. You're not going to be here. You like to molest little girls. You're not going to be here. We're not going to tolerate. James is writing what are the minimums, the essentials of keeping the commandments that you cannot offend and be in fellowship with us. The last point, he says, from blood and from things strangled. Well, if you go back into Leviticus chapter 17, the chapter just before, chapter 18, you'll find out that's what we were commonly referred to as kosher, that which is fit and proper that you call food. There's lots of animals out there, but God has specifically said there's certain animals that are clean, you can use those for food, and there's certain animals that are unclean and you cannot use them for food. The most obvious one that I'm sure the world is familiar with is pig. God says, no, pig is not considered clean, therefore you cannot make it food. But as you know, it's very common in our world today, especially in the Christian world, they love to have an Easter ham. Now, according to the law of Moses, that's an abomination for you to associate that as your feast having anything to do with God. And according to this letter, you're not acceptable in any of the congregations if you do that. 
My, 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 my. Here we have a letter from the Apostle James been written to the entire Gentile believing the world, and it says of these three things that you Christians should not under any circumstances be doing. But the Christian world does it. And Christian teachers say it's okay to do it. The fact of the matter is that when you participate in the common holiday of Easter, the common holiday of Christmas, the common holiday of Halloween, you're practicing idolatry according to the Bible. According to the Bible, you're practicing idolatry. Um, all that business about uh, fornication and sexual aberration, you know the greatest controversy in the churches today is they're trying to figure out a way to accept uh, homosexuals and lesbians into the church. There's splits going on in major denominations over this issue. Every, every church is wrestling with this. What do we do with these homosexuals that say they're believers and want to come in and join the church and be accepted? What about, are you ready for this, homosexual marriage? Marriage is definitely a law that came from God. You can go back into Genesis and read about that. And they want to use a religious law of marriage and they want to apply it to homosexuals. My, 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 my. Or do I, do I need to go ahead and explain to you a good old BLT with pork bacon? Every one of these things that James wrote that's recorded for you in the New Testament is completely being ignored by Christian teachers. As a messianic teacher, I'm coming to you and I'm telling you, wait a minute, this is specific instruction. This isn't uh, my interpretation of the law. This is from the apostles. This is from Peter and Paul and James. And they're saying that you as a believer with faith in the Messiah, you are to be keeping these commandments. And that goes hand in hand with your faith in the Lord. Not for salvation, but so that you can be in fellowship with other believers. If you want to be in fellowship with other believers, you have to do these minimum things. Now, it's not that those are the only commandments you keep. You're actually supposed to keep all of the commandments. But if you're going to be in fellowship with us, you've got to do these as essentials. Now, you essentially, he wrote this to give clarification because the Pharisaic believers were putting all kinds of commandments which weren't commandments that came from Moses and the prophets. They were putting add-on commandments, the, the, the lavender of the Pharisees, as Yeshua, Yeshua talked about. We don't want you to follow that. We want you to just stick with what Moses and the prophets said. That's essentially what the message is. And oh, by the way, here's three essentials that you have to start keeping right now to be part of the fellowship of where we're at. Now, should there be any further question about the commandments and what is to be taught, here's the way James summarizes this. You're going to love this one. Verse 21, For Moses from generations of old hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath. You know what James just said? If you're a Gentile believer, and you have any question about how to keep the commandments of the Lord, what you need to do is go tell them to a synagogue on Sabbath and hear one of the teachers of Moses. You need to hear the instruction of a Torah teacher. That's what you need so that you can understand what are the different commandments that I'm supposed to be keeping. I can assure you, and I can take you back into the law of Moses, and every major commandment that is given by Moses, emphatically given, specifically says the following things. This is a commandment for the native-born, 
for the alien and the sojourner who may be with you, you shall keep them. There shall be one law, one spirit, one commandment for all people. That's what Moses said. That's what James just said. And Peter and Paul agree with him. That's the instruction. Now, they went so emphatic with this that they dispatched two additional witnesses. James called upon two witnesses from Jerusalem to go with that letter so that the letter, there would be no question about who wrote that letter, where that letter come from, who said that. They dispatched additional witnesses to testify, to verify this is the instruction, this is the definition that answers the whole question. How do we bring Gentiles into the faith, and how, do they keep the law? And for what reason would they keep the law? Now, the reason why I bring this up is because we have, um, we have gotten this whole thing confused. This thing has all been fouled up. You know, the whole concept of what the law does and doesn't do has been kind of befuddled. And as I said to you, the Christian teachers have taken it a whole different direction. But let's go back to the Apostle Paul on this subject. There's a place where he addresses this subject very emphatically. It's in the book of Romans. And um, the, the, anybody who a, is a, a good Christian teacher, we know that the book of Romans is one of the most substantial doctrinal books in our New Testament faith. He does an incredible good job of explaining justification by faith. In other words, how, are, how is it that we're saved? And you know what he uses as his primary example? Abraham. He explains how Abraham got saved. And he tries to go in and saying, you Gentiles and everybody else, you get saved the same way he gets saved. Now, Abraham was before the law. Abraham didn't have the law of Moses. And it's clear he was saved. And so Paul's making the argument, countering Jewish teachers, rabbis, who would suggest to you, oh, the only way that you can come to faith in God and the only way you can be in his kingdom is by keeping the law. And, and Paul's making this argument about Abraham didn't keep the law. He obeyed the Lord from his heart even before Moses came along and gave the Ten Commandments. He was obeying the Lord already from the heart. And his faith is what led to his salvation. And so he explains this. And here's the way he, he gives his rendition of what took place in Acts chapter 15. Romans 3, beginning of verse 28, it says, We reckon, therefore, that a man is justified by faith apart from the works of the law. Or is God the God of the Jews only? Is he not God of the Gentiles also? Yea, of the Gentiles also. God created the whole earth and everybody in it. He didn't just create Israel and the Jewish people. If so be that God is one, and he shall justify the circumcision by faith, and the uncircumcision by faith, do we then make the law of none effect through faith? God forbid. Nay, we establish the law. Now let me explain that to you just a little bit more. So we have this wonderful faith from God. We have the great work of redemption that's done by the Messiah. Here's the fundamental question. Did the Messiah come and fulfill the law and diminish it, make it go away and we, now that we have the Messiah? You know what Paul says? No. Absolutely not. Do we make the law of none effect through faith? As a result of getting faith, does the word fulfill mean diminish, pass away, fade away, annul? No. He's, in fact, he uses the term, God forbid, that you would think such a thing. Going back to Yeshua, don't even think that I came to do away with that. He said, we establish the law. Wow. We actually make the law stronger. We actually make the law more of effect than 
than it had been previously. Well, that's what Yeshua said. I came to fulfill the law. Now that we know it doesn't mean diminish and go away, now we understand the word fulfill means something completely different. It means I'm going to fill up the law full of even more meaning. It's like this cup. When he fills it to where it's filled full, that cup now is an excellent cup for me to drink from. It, it has what I need. It has all that I need. It's filled. It's been full. It's full. And that is what Yeshua was talking about. And oh, by the way, that is what Yeshua taught. I, I know this is going to come as a shock to you, but Yeshua taught the law. He taught how to keep the law even better. We're going to go into that in, in the course of our future discussions. But I want to take you to uh, a little bit further to um, some other things that John the Apostle had to say, joining with Peter and Paul back there at the council. In other words, it's very clear from the council of Jerusalem that the law definitely is to be a part of the Gentile faith. It doesn't mean that it's salvation, but it's definitely part of their how you walk out your faith, how you walk out uh, your belief in God. John was also part of that, and so he writes in his letters, after he wrote his gospel, he writes instruction out to the brethren. And if you recall, John also traveled out amongst the Gentiles. And um, he was later exiled on the island of Patmos. They didn't like what he was doing. But let's look at some of the teaching he did, some of the writing he did in his instruction. Let me take you to 1 John chapter 2, beginning at verse 4. He that saith, I know him, and keeps not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. What? This is the Apostle John now. He says, if I'm talking to a believer, and he says to me, I have faith in God, but I don't have to keep those commandments, he says, that man is a liar, and the truth is not in him. He then goes forward and says it to the positive, verse 5. But whoso keeps his word, in him verily hath the love of God been perfected. Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought himself also to walk even as he walked. That's speaking to the positive. If you keep the word of God, and keep means to obey it. If you obey the commandments of God and what God taught and said, that's how you perfect the love of God. You know, the commandment to love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, and mind, you do it by keeping the commandments. You don't do it by sitting there going, okay, I love you, God. It's not how you do it. You do it by doing what he said. God then interprets, you love me. Well, by the way, the same thing is true in every one of our relationships that we have with one another, especially between parent and child. You show your child that you love them by disciplining them and teaching them and correcting them so that when they mature, they'll be safe. They'll know how to live. If you don't love your child, don't teach them anything. Don't hold them to the line. Don't discipline them. That's a definite way to prove you don't love them. Well, the same thing is true of the child. You want to show that you love your parents? Do what they say. When you're rebellious, the truth of the matter is a rebellious teen does not love their parents. That's a fact. You do the things for the person that you love. If you don't love them, you're not going to do anything with them not going to do what they request or what they want. Well, the same thing is true in our relationship with God. If you want to have a relationship with God, then do what he says, obey him. And this is essentially what John has said. Let me say it to you again. But whoso keepeth his word in him, verily hath the love of God been perfected. 
Hereby we know that we are in him. He that saith he abideth in him ought also to walk even as he walked. We should walk the same way that Yeshua walked. Did Yeshua keep the law? Did he keep the commandments? The answer is very clear he did. In fact, the definition we say of Yeshua, he was sinless. You know what sinless means? You have not transgressed or violated any of God's commandments. That's the definition of sinless. He kept the law. And for him to be the Passover sacrifice, spiritually, he had to be found with no spot or blemish whatsoever to be qualified as the sacrifice for the Passover. He did that. He walked according to the instructions of Moses and the prophets. In the Hebrew, the word for walk is called halakha. And halakha is defined as keeping the commandments. So when it says, John says, you should walk in the same way that he walked, you should have the same halakha that he had. And that halakha is one of demonstrated obedience to God. You know, you know what we call a hypocrite? It's a guy who says he believes in God and yet he doesn't obey God. You need to listen to that again. A hypocrite is someone who says they believe in God but don't obey him. Uh, I'm, I'm saying this in love to my fellow Christian brethren. Um, do you understand what that means if you've decided that you believe in Yeshua, but you're not going to obey his commandments? By the way, hypocrites are not held in high esteem by God. I have bad news for you. He doesn't think very well of them. And they have punishment and judgment awaiting them. And God has been very emphatic about doing that. So here's the bottom line. You believers in Yeshua, you're supposed to be keeping all of the commandments. The three essentials for you to be in fellowship are stop participating with idols, stop participating in any of those sexual sins that are listed by the law, and stop doing unclean things. Um, by the way, all of that instruction for those essentials that uh, James was talking about, it comes from Leviticus 17 and 18. I'm a Torah teacher. Let me tell you what we Torah teachers refer to when we say Leviticus 17 and 18. You ready for this? It's called the heart of the law. The heart, just as the heart is a vital organ in your body, your body cannot live without it. You cannot walk out your faith in God if you violate these commandments in Leviticus 17 and 18. It's called the heart of the law. That is what James was teaching, and that's what James was writing his letter about. He was giving you a summarized teaching of Leviticus 17 and 18. But that's not the only instructions in the law for people that follow the God of Israel or believe in the Messiah. There's a whole bunch of other instructions. But the problem is that we don't have too many believers today walking around teaching Moses and the prophets. We have lots of teachers going around teaching the New Testament, teaching you about things that Paul said, twisting what Paul has said to make it sound like, oh, that we came to do away with the law. Don't you know that Paul said that Yeshua is the end of the law? I love that one. Actual proper translation is that Yeshua is the goal of the law. The goal of the law? Meaning this is the, the highest part of it? Yeah. The Messiah is the highest part of the law. You cannot have the Messiah that is intended to be the Messiah if you don't have the law to begin with. Remember, faith establishes the law. They all work together. They're not at odds with one another. Now, I recognize that um, uh, you've been, as Christians, you've been taught differently. All right. Okay. You didn't make that decision. 
And in fact, your teachers didn't even make the decision. These are things that were decided way back a long time ago, and this error was made a long time ago. The book of Acts 15 is giving you some of it, telling you about it. In fact, when you get up into Acts 21, they didn't stop the rumor. The rumor had started that the Apostle Paul was out teaching the Gentile believers they don't have to circumcise their sons, they don't have to keep the law. That was the rumor that came out of it. And the New Testament says it was clearly a rumor against Paul. And James, this same guy who wrote this letter to the Gentiles, he instructed James, or excuse me, he instructed Paul to do certain things at the temple with some of the local believers to convince all of the Jewish believers, are you ready, that were tens of thousands of believers in and around Israel who not only believed in Yeshua, but were all zealous for the law. That's what James says in Acts 22. I need you, Paul, to go into the temple, do these things, so they will know this rumor. There's no truth to this rumor that you yourself, Paul, walk orderly, keeping the law. We call that the rumor against Paul. To this day, in the Christian world, they're still passing out the rumor against Paul. Even though the New Testament clearly says and proves it was not true. Yet Christianity still teaches it, that Paul came to do away with it. But I'm going to shift gears for you, and we're going to start now. And in the next episode, I'm really going to get into this. I'm going to show you where Yeshua taught the law. We're going to look at some very specific commandments that's in the law, and we're going to look at how Yeshua taught those commandments, and he's going to take issue with what the Pharisees had said about those commandments. He's going to take issue with other teachers who had put add-ons and other definitions to the teaching of the law, and you're going to hear what Yeshua, how he taught the law. And whether you realize it or not, this is Yeshua going to be teaching the law. To do that, I'm just going to introduce it for you. Next uh, episode, we're going to get into this great detail. This is the follow-on teaching of Matthew chapter 5. You know, the passage where he said, Think not that I came to abolish the law and the prophets, but to fulfill. He doesn't end the conversation there. He immediately is going to go into verse 21, and he's going to start teaching you the law. Those two conversations are connected. Not only do, don't think that I came to abolish, I'm now going to teach you the law so you understand it fully and completely. That's what we're getting ready to go into our next study with. It's connected to the very statement, I did not come to abolish it. Don't even think it. I came to teach it. I came to explain it. I came to make it full, fuller in your life than it's ever been before. Next week... I look forward to seeing you. This is going to be a very fun teaching for you. Again, Messianic teachings for you Christians. Love all of you. Hang in there. Shabbat Shalom. Thank you, folks, for viewing our broadcast here on the YouTube channel. I'd like to remind you, if you could hit that like or subscribe button for it, it's very helpful to our organization. And again, thank you for viewing our broadcast.